I think, uh, like many others, when first seeing the resource survival data, we were all very happily or pleasantly surprised. Uh, a three-month median improvement in overall survival uh, is not only statistically significant, but clinically very significant. Uh, this is especially in the context of what's been going on in liver cancer research and for the past decade. Uh, as many people are aware, serafinib has been the only drug that's been approved. Uh, and despite many efforts to improve on serafinib in the front line, uh, most approaches, essentially all approaches, have, have not met their endpoints. And similarly, in second line, an area that we thought was a low-hanging uh, fruit or, or a low hurdle for improvement, being that placebo has been the control arm, uh, all the agents looked at in large phase three studies have failed. And then we have this resource study, and not only is it the first positive study, but it's very positive. And I think uh, we're all very excited about that. The field needed uh, some new positive data, and I, I, I think this incremental improvement will, will be good for patients and good for the field. So, We've been trying to improve outcomes for patients with advanced liver cancer for several years. Uh, there's been numerous phase three studies done, um, all of them unsuccessful in achieving their goal of improving overall survival. And now we have the resource study, which for the first time has uh, a significant improvement in median overall survival, improving survival by three months uh, with the addition of Stavarga versus uh, Stavarga plus best supportive care versus best supportive care alone. And I think for sure this is gonna, you know, change the way we manage patients with advanced liver cancer. Just as the uh, data from the SHARP study uh, influenced how we manage patients with systemic therapy, uh, the positive data from resource is gonna continue to, uh, to change that landscape. I, I think certainly this is practice changing uh, for, there is now an option for these patients. Uh, three months, I think, is a strong start, and, and hopefully we'll continue to improve on that. Uh, but this, I think, lends credence to the idea that systemic therapy does play a role in advanced liver cancer. So there's no question that chemoembolization plays a significant role in the management of patients with unresectable liver cancer. We need to keep in mind that unresectable liver cancer is not one disease, but several subgroups of patients. And for those patients who fit within the Barcelona B stage or intermediate, you know, multifocal tumors in the liver, good performance status, no extra hepatic spread, no vascular invasion, chemoembolization is a very appropriate and effective way to manage those patients. The challenge over the past several years as serafinib uh, uh, came into play was that transition from intermediate to advanced where systemic therapy is proven to be of benefit. And there has been, I think, uh, still some hesitancy to go to systemic therapy even when patients are progressing on chemoembolization or they develop a contraindication to or what is felt to be a perceived contraindication to chemoembolization, such as vascular invasion, but still the tumor is confined to the liver. And some clinicians will say, well, we can do chemoembolization in those patients. Uh, it, it's safe. Question is, does it help them? That has never been well defined in randomized studies with chemoembolization. Uh, now you have, have an experience where you've gone from serafinib improving survival by three months on median from the phase three studies to now serafinib plus Tavarga with another incremental increase of three months versus placebo. So I think this speaks to the fact that these agents are active in liver cancer, that we are not just improving response rates or time to regression, but we're improving overall survival. And that you know this continuum should hopefully build on the, the high level of evidence that systemic therapy plays a role in patients with advanced liver cancer. And our definition of advanced, I think, needs to, to go back and question, again, the role of continuing chemoembolization when patients, uh, when patients 
present with criteria that would fit into the clinical studies uh, such as SHARP and RESOURCE. The fact that for the past decade we've only had one positive phase three study, and that being the SHARP study uh, with a median overall survival of three months, I think has, has made people a little discouraged with the role of systemic therapy. Uh, that, you know, three months is significant, it's not a cure, uh, but it is significant, but at the same time there was room for improvement, and there continues to be room for improvement. The Resource data now in second line, again, I think gives uh, credence to, to the idea that systemic therapy plays a role in the treatment of advanced liver cancer. And, uh, you know, three-month improvement from SHARP, three-month improvement from resource, you know, these are incremental improvements that, that we need to now view as, you know, substantial data sets and need to start incorporating that into the appropriate patient populations. And uh, this idea that chemoembolization until someone decompensates or chemoembolization uh, until there's extra hepatic metastatic disease and then go to systemic therapy might not be you know, the exact transition points. So for patients with intermediate stage liver cancer, Barcelona stage B, uh, as we commented, chemomization plays an important role. Uh, it's been noted that, you know, if a patient does not die of their cirrhosis, uh, their cancer will become refractory to chemomization or they will develop a, 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 a new site of disease or some other clinical symptom that makes chemoembolization uh, less attractive. And what makes it less attractive, I think, is the data that supports that it works. I think when we have large phase three randomized studies, uh, regardless of whether it was with local regional therapy or with a systemic therapy, large randomized placebo-controlled studies are high levels of evidence and should dictate Treatment, uh, treatment decisions probably more so than uh, individual experience. And in the context of, you know, the Sharafnib SHARP studies, Asia Pacific study, and now with resource, there's very strong data that for patients who are Barcelona C, uh, so patients who meet those criteria of less performance status or cancer-related symptoms, extra hepatic spread, macrovascular invasion, those patients are all very appropriate patients and should be triaged to systemic therapy. But still, there are also a group of patients with Barcelona stage B intermediate disease who are candidates for systemic therapy. They've always been included in these phase three studies. And that is a group of patients who are getting local regional therapy, but you know, local regional therapy can't keep up with the pace of their disease. They have rapid recurrence, uh, their disease is not completely controlled with taste, and it's those patients who would also be considered appropriate for that transition to systemic therapy. So one of Regorafinib's first approvals was in colorectal cancer, advanced colorectal cancer in the late line of therapy. And you know, there was a fairly high incidence of adverse events, specifically grade three and grade four events, which remarkably were toned down in the resource data. I think uh, besides the, the strong efficacy data, and again, in oncology with new drugs, we always need to measure the efficacy versus the safety and tolerability. And what I think uh, was, was surprising was how well the drug was tolerated in this group of patients. Uh, There's a very low incidence of grade three, four events in the resource study as compared to the colorectal study. Uh, there's some ideas why that might be the case. Uh, you know, obviously, the re uh, resource study took patients who had a prior multi-kinase inhibitor uh, with some overlapping toxicities, and, and the fact that they could be on serafinib for some period of time and then go on to the resource study uh, speaks to maybe a patient profile that tolerates these drugs better, uh, but also the patients in the colorectal cohorts, you know, had a lot of chemotherapy for, for months or years, and 
and that probably affects their tolerability as well. So, you know, I think there's always a leap from a research study to clinical practice, and and uh, we will we will see how that data shapes up in anyone's clinical experience. Uh, I think there's also a learned experience to managing the toxicities, right? Serafinib has been around a long time, uh, and phys physicians, clinicians have become a little more experienced on how to manage the multi-kinase inhibitor side effect profile, which also uh, might explain the lower incidence of adverse events. For the past 10 years, uh, about the past 10 years, the only drug we've had for advanced liver cancer has been serafinib. And uh, the challenge for us managing patients is, you know, how do we identify patients where serafinib isn't working? And for those patients, what do we do after? This has obviously been an area of great uh, clinical research and certainly uh, you know, I think we need to still encourage patients to go on clinical studies to help move things forward. Uh, to me, there's always been somewhat of a sweet spot between progression on serafinib and the opportunity to get someone into a clinical trial to consider them for second-line treatment. Uh, you know, there's always going to be a few different groups of patients. There are patients who will get serafinib and you know, get sick very quickly. They'll be, because their disease progresses, there'll be a group of patients who get a benefit from serafinib for some period of time. And then their disease slowly starts to progress. And at what point do you say serafinib isn't working? Uh, we know that the response rate with serafinib is, is very, very low. Uh, and most of its benefit is by slowing progression. And the SHARP study was done that patients could continue on serafinib beyond radiographic progression uh, until symptomatic progression, a subset of patients did that. And now in clinical practice, you know, how do we, how do we now incorporate the resource data, which is positive data suggesting that taking regorafenib after serafinib progression improves overall survival. And I think we need to, one, give patients the benefit of the doubt with serafinib. It's proven to work in the front line. Uh, and there's going to be some clinical judgment, right? Uh, you know, in, in my practice, I, I have historically always given patients the benefit of the doubt, uh, even if there's a little increase from scan to scan. Uh, if, if it's not life-threatening, uh, then I think we could give them a little longer. And then at some point, uh, there is the feeling that we need to try something else. And whether that will be a clinical study or now with the phase three study from resource, uh, that would be a transition to regorafenib. I think one way to think about it is when you see that patient and their scan suggests progression, there has to be the question in your mind, uh, do I have time to watch this patient a little longer on serafinib, right? Uh, that if I wait another two months when they get imaged again, for example, or three months, am I going to lose the opportunity to give them a second line treatment? And that really depends on where they progress, how they are progressing. And that, I think, actually is how I would look at it. So. <laughs> The, uh, the challenge in, in managing patients with liver cancer is it's, uh, it's a complicated disease. Uh, there's the interplay between their cirrhosis and their tumor burden. Uh, I think ultimately and ideally patients should be managed within the context of a multidisciplinary program where all the relative clinicians managing the disease are reviewing things at a tumor board. Uh, whether that be surgery, interventional radiology, hepatology, uh, and oncology. Uh, you know, I think there's still a bias towards local regional therapy. And if a patient can undergo a local regional therapy, often it is done uh, not necessarily asking, you know, is the data supporting that intervention, you know, the best thing? Is there strong clinical data to suggest that this will benefit the patient. 
And sometimes in that context, by the time patients come to systemic therapy, whether it be a clinical trial or serafinib, uh, you know, they're sick, you know, and they, they might not be uh, the best candidates for systemic therapy. And, and if that's the case, they're not going to get much beyond their first line treatment. So, you know, there's a big, uh, there has to be a big push in identifying patients earlier, not just for systemic treatment, but in general, you know, a higher awareness of liver disease, a higher awareness of liver cancer, and then also a higher awareness that, you know, the best patients for systemic therapy are the ones who are, uh, are not severely compromised from their liver disease, from pr excessive prior treatments. Because certainly the patients who go on to second line, that really reflects who you have in the front line. And I think, I think uh, some of the challenge has been that the patients are starting first line uh, maybe more advanced. Uh, so by the time they're done with first line treatment, you know, they're sick. There's always going to be a group of patients who start on first line and, and aren't going to be candidates for second line just because of the biology of their disease and how their tumors behave. But I think there's also a component that patients are coming to advanced disease a little later in their course.